Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us the legendary Noam Chomsky. Noam, welcome to News Click. Good to be with you. Thanks. Even if only virtually. <laughs> um, about 60 years ago, 70 years ago, M.A. Cesar wrote a line which I wanted to read out to you. He said, a civilization that cannot solve the problems that it's created is a decadent civilization. I, I find this to be a very apposite line, Noam. How would you characterize the civilization, particularly in the Western countries in our time? 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Failed States, which was primarily about the United States, but it generalizes to other Western societies. Uh, they have, especially in the past 40, plenty of problems before, but for the poor past 40 years, uh, most of the West has been engaged in a project which is great for the people who designed it. They're living in heaven but it's a disaster for almost everyone else. It's called neoliberalism. It began in the 70s, really took off with Reagan and Thatcher. Uh, the, the design was pretty clear in the beginning. We now see the results. They worked out pretty much as anticipated. The wealth has concentrated to an extraordinary level. Uh, the general population has stagnated, declined. I take the United States, uh, by now 0.1%, not 1%, 0.1% of the population has 20% of the wealth. About half the population has negative net worth, debts, other liabilities greater than assets. Roughly 70% or so are living from paycheck to paycheck anything goes wrong, tough luck. Uh, uh, benefits have significantly declined. Concentration of wealth, of course, immediately translates into even greater control over the political system. It's always great, but it's intensified. Um, that shows up in the legislation, which is designed to destroy unions, to destroy labor rights, to create a uh, global system, uh, which turns out to be harmful for the perpetrators now, a very fragile global system designed to squeeze every cent of profit out of uh, possible with mobility of capital, of course, no mobility of labor, uh, free and, and highly protectionist. A lot of talk about free market, but that's garbage. Highly protectionist system designed uh, to ensure investor rights. Uh, so take drug drugs, for example, since that's on everyone's mind. Uh, th uh, there is a drug, remdesivir, which seems to be of some use in overcoming symptoms. It's owned by a corporation, Gilead, huge drug company. Now, the drug was produced in part on, as always, by government research development uh, subsidies, but they want a patent on it. And according to the neoliberal rules in the World Trade Organization, they have monopoly rights you know, for decades. So they can charge you know, $20,000 a dose if they want to. Now there happens to be a law in the United States, uh, by Dole law if you want, let's look it up, which requires, not permits, requires the government to ensure that if a drug is produced with government support, it be available to the public at reasonable price. But we live with criminal governments. They don't pay any attention to the law, none. Uh, Reagan made that very clear, everyone else follows him. So nobody pays attention to this law, so they can charge what they want. Well, now there's so much public pressure that maybe they'll back off a little. But that's the way the system's designed. And it's had uh, these effects on the general public. It's led, uh, I've left out a lot, it's created a, what's called a precariat 
huge number of people with very precarious positions, no unions, no support. As Thatcher pointed out, there's no society. Reagan and Thatcher were right on target. The first things they did was move to destroy unions. They're the only protection that people have against predatory capitalism. Uh, so let's destroy them. Uh, Reagan didn't even enforce, not he didn't even purposely didn't enforce the labor laws that require you know, some observance of labor rights and hires you know, scabs illegal everywhere in the world to break up strikes. Corporations immediately picked up the ball and did the same. So people are left on their own kind of atomized. Uh, one consequence is a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, hatred of institutions. It's feral terrain for demagogues to come along and say somebody else's fault. You know, immigrants, uh, black, blacks, uh, Reagan's uh, welfare mothers. He was an extraordinary racist, you know, blaming the plight of things on rich black women who drive in their limousines to welfare offices to steal your check. Now that kind of Trump is a master at this, but does it all the time. Uh, that's what the big fuss is about uh, building the wall and so on. So, oh, and it's happening in many countries. Uh, it's easy terrain for demagogues. That's the world we're facing. It's a world of extreme savage capitalism. It's had 40 years to wreck things. Europe it's intensified by the structure of the European Union, which transfers all decisions, major decisions, to an unelected Troika in Brussels, you know, with the big banks looking over their shoulders. You can predict what that's going to be. So yeah, it's a, the world is in, I haven't even mentioned the worst part. I mean, let's take India. In 50 years, India is going to be uninhabitable under present, if the present conditions persist, very likely, not for certain. But under the current course, the best scientific analyses suggest that India will simply be on, all of South Asia will be uninhabitable just because of roasting the planet. Uh, who does this benefit? The rich and powerful, fossil fuel companies, big banks, uh, uh, manufacturing polluters. Uh, what are we doing about it? Well, most countries are doing at least something. The country that's doing most is the United States. It is racing to the abyss as quickly as possible. Trump's main program is to destroy the prospects for organized human life, literally. This is the most criminal president, human, who has ever lived on earth. I mean, Hitler was a monster. He wanted to kill all the Jews, kill all the Roma, 30 million Slavs, we can get rid of it. He didn't want to destroy organized human life on earth. Trump does. Now, he knows exactly what he's doing. It just doesn't matter. And the people behind him, uh, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, pouring money into fossil fuels, they, they understand perfectly well. It just doesn't matter. The logic under which they operate says, maximize your own gain tomorrow. Nothing else matters. Uh, in fact, if you read the neoliberal gurus, people they worship, Milton Friedman, says it straight. Says the only role of a corporation is to maximize profit for shareholders, and of course, management. They destroy the world, it's not their business. And civilization would collapse if you don't live up to this. Now, this is neoliberal doctrine back to the 1920s. It's not new. Now, this stuff goes back to, in fact, the concept neoliberalism goes back to the 20s in Austria. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, the great guru, Friedrich Hayek, they love authority. They talk about you know, not liking the state. Total lie. They love the state. They love state power. Uh, von Mises in the 20s could care, barely control his euphoria when the neo 
incipient fascist regime in Austria smashed up the labor movement, destroyed social democracy by violence. So that was wonderful. It was eliminating interferences with sound economics. Uh, he praised fascism as saving civilization. Uh, when the Pinochet dictatorship came in, they rushed to endorse it and to take part in it. It was a perfect experiment for their neoliberal ideals. There could be no objections. The torture chambers took care of that. Uh, money poured in, you know, from international investors, from the World Bank, from the United States. Uh, they were smart enough to overcome their doctrines, to leave in place the highly efficient uh, nationalized uh, copper company, Cadelco, which was the basis for most of the state revenue, so forgot their doctrines with that. Perfect experiment. And what happened? Five years, they totally crashed the economy. The state had to take over more than it had under Allende. Did that affect anything? No. In fact, Hayek uh, said that uh, when he visited uh, Chile under Pinochet, he said, I couldn't find a single person who didn't say that there's more freedom under Pinochet than there was before, which is probably true considering the people he saw. That's neoliberalism. They're perfectly happy to emerge from the present crisis with a system very much like the one they instituted in their benefit, but much harder, more brutal, more authoritarian, more police control. That's fine. That's perfectly consistent with neoliberal ideals back a century. So we should not be surprised at that. And of course, they're working on it relentlessly. While well, they're telling everybody else, to, you know, stay home, they're working very hard to ensure that the outcome will look very much like this. It's a brutal form of class war unfolding before our eyes. But as you say this, Norm, which is, I think, something that you <coughs> would have anticipated, you know, given um, our understanding of what was going on, we would anticipate this. In fact, as you said, your book was called A Failed State. But as we are talking, the streets of the United States are on fire. People have decided that they're just not going to take it after the murder of George Floyd. And even liberals seem to be losing patience. I read George Packer. He wrote an article with the title, We Are Living in a Failed State. It's quite astounding to see a liberal write about the failed state. And of course, it's heartbreaking to see the murder of another African-American, but then to see people come on the street. I mean, this reaction must, I mean, you know, give us at least some sense of hope? Well, actually, the, what's happening does give a sense of hope. First of all, the murder of George Floyd is not an unusual event. I mean, events like this used to happen pretty frequently, and nobody paid any attention to them. What's encouraging, hard to say this, in the midst of these horrors. But what's encouraging is there is a reaction that shows that there has been a kind of improvement in the level of civilization in the country. Things that passed under the radar before, at least a lot of people noticed. No, they didn't protest before, but they're protesting now. But let me say a word of criticism about it. I can understand it, sympathize with it, good thing. But notice the focus on the few policemen. One of them is a murderer. Uh, three others stood by and did nothing. And there's a lot of denunciations of those three who stood by. But it's useful every once in a while to look into the mirror. Can you think of anyone else who's stood by for actually you know, all of our lifetimes long before while all these things are happening and didn't do anything? 
people like me, for example, and the rest of us, uh, what have we done to alleviate the circumstances that lead to this? So yes, we can certainly blame the policeman for standing by, but there's a deeper problem, deeply ingrained in white society, even people who are activists and protesters. We pretty much stood by. Uh, this, the protests today are very reminiscent of others. So in 1992, after the Rodney, Rodney King murder by police in Los Angeles, and uh, uh, after the policemen who killed him were released on, you know, without from the court without any punishment, there were huge protests. Um, a week of protests, I think about 60 people were killed, or federal troops were brought in. Uh, uh, the effect, as usual, was to shift public attention to rioters. We have to have more law and order, more force. That's the typical response to protests that become violent. Uh, where we're living in, except now there's more protest. And I should say this raises a question that activists should ask themselves. They should always ask themselves. You have to distinguish between tactics that make you feel good and tactics that actually do good. The ones that make you feel good are easy. Like if I can break a window and show how angry I am, it makes me feel good. Is it doing good? No. It's a gift to President Trump and the right wing. They love it. And, they, and so it's maybe hard to restrain yourself in times of bitterness and horror and crisis. If you ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve? The answer of what to do is quite clear. Over time, consistently, nonviolent protests, which are hard, take courage, or strength. These have shifted opinion in support of the cause we're advancing. Violent protests consistently have been a gift to the harsher, more brutal elements in the society. And you have to think about that if you're serious about the cause. It's hard. It's not easy. It's easy to sympathize with especially blacks who had the boot on their neck for 400 years. You know, can't criticize any reaction. But on the part of others, they should really be thinking about these things. That's a very powerful uh, thought because I think the question of strategy and the question of tactics should be taken, of course, very seriously. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that uh, I think doesn't get talked about much. Um, at our institute, Tricontinental, we are playing with the concept of Corona shock. And we are suggesting that while the more capitalist states have been having a harder time with this pandemic, it's quite extraordinary that socialist countries seem to be bearing up much better. One of the first books I read of yours was the New Mandarin, the you know New Mandarin's uh, book, which was about Vietnam. Uh, it affected me a great deal, Noam, because your writings on Vietnam were so important for those of us coming up and understanding American power. Um, Vietnam and Prime Minister Nguyen have had a completely different attitude to the global pandemic. And in fact, despite sharing a 1,400-kilometer border with China, they have had no casualties. And I wonder if you have anything to say about this country that was so brutally bombed by the United States you know, for a considerable part of its 20th century history, has been able not only to have no casualties, but donated 440,000 you know, pieces of protective uh, of clothing to the United States. How is one to understand this? A country so brutalized is being so generous in the middle of a global pandemic. Well, it is pretty striking to see the reactions of the Vietnam figures, which I can't verify, but scientists seem to take them seriously. They seem to indicate that 
the number of fatalities was either very low, maybe even zero. Uh, in fact, if you look over when the pandemic struck, uh, the United States was singularly unprepared. And there were many reasons for this. Uh, the main reason it is, is that it is the most business run of any society. But when a society is business run, it's going to be geared for profit for the rich. That's almost a tautology. So hospitals were run on the business model, kind of like a, an assembly plan. You don't have spare resources. You don't have an extra bid. That would be a waste of money. Uh, it doesn't work very well, even in normal times. But in, uh, when there's a catastrophe, you know, or even anything mildly wrong, it's a catastrophe. Uh, when under Obama, who was science oriented, uh, he did uh, have the, George W. The first W. Bush, Bush the you know, H. W. had established a science advisory board. When Obama came to office, he, within the first days of his administration, he activated it and he asked them to work out proposals for an impending pandemic. Everyone knew it was coming. So what should we do? And within a couple of weeks, they gave him a detailed plan and it was implemented. As soon as Trump came into office, first days, dismantled the whole thing. No profit in it. This is extreme neoliberalism instead of mild neoliberalism. Extreme savagery instead of mild savagery. Uh, from the first day in office, Trump uh, defunded the Center for Disease Control every year, eliminated programs of American scientists working in China with Chinese scientists to try to identify potential coronaviruses, hard, dangerous work. Chinese scientists, some of them were killed doing it. Uh, but all of this dismantled. So that's the extreme end. US totally unprepared. After the, within days, China, amazingly fast, Chinese scientists had identified the virus, sequenced the genome, given it to the world, everybody knew. Uh, US, nothing. Uh, intelligence knew, health officials knew, didn't want to do anything. Uh, that's the worst. Europe was sort of in the middle. Some reacted, some didn't. We don't pay attention to these Asians. But in the China area, almost everybody reacted. Vietnam was remarkable, but New Zealand, Australia reacted, have it contained. South Korea was one of the most remarkable. They had a very severe outbreak, immediately contained it, very almost total testing, no lockdowns. They didn't need it because they used the test and trace techniques and have it pretty much under control. Taiwan, the same, Hong Kong, the same, Singapore, pretty much. Singapore even had hospitals that had been established and kept vacant in case there would be a pandemic. Uh, the West, much worse. Uh, the United States, the bottom of the barrel. And I think it pretty much correlates with uh, to what extent is a government business run? To what extent does the government care about its population? These are inversely correlated. Uh, not always. You have dictatorships that don't care about the population. But among the countries we're talking about, these are inversely correlated pretty much. And you sort of see it. Uh, so uh, yeah, in fact, one of the most amazing cases, which is another gap you're not allowed to talk about here, is Cuba. Now, there's something called the European Union. Union. There's a rich country, Germany. Now, they were able to more or less contain it extra capacity, extra household diagnostic capacity and so on. Pretty low death rate, very rich country. And there's another country, not very far to the south, which had a huge pandemic in the north, Italy, northern Italy. Do you see German doctors in northern Italy? I mean, if so, it's been kept a secret. You do see doctors from Cuba, the one internationalist country in the world which once again is sending 
thousands of doctors to places most affected, working in the most difficult conditions, uh, just the way they did after the huge earthquake in Haiti and Pakistan. Uh, this is a country that's, I don't have to tell you, it's been under the US boot for 60 years. The US is trying to crush it, terrorist wars, economic warfare, so stringent that if a Swedish company wants to send medical equipment, they can't because there might be some, they might via the anger, the mafia don, so they can't do it. And it's Cuba, first of all, that has it pretty much under control itself and uh, is now sending help to other countries. I mean, the irony of this is beyond words. It's another thing that you don't see headlined in the press exactly. In fact, when it is discussed, occasionally it is, Cuba is attacked for forced labor, for forcing doctors to go so the state can rob them. Well, this is based on a, like a lot of vulgar propaganda, it is based on a sliver of truth. And a part of the funding that goes to the doctors goes back to the government to use for health services, for training and improving the health services. Now, Cuba's totalitarian state, slave labor, you got to increase the punishment. Is this manufacturing consent? Well, it's a pretty good example of it, I think. But here's the European Union on the one hand and getting international aid from the one internationalist state in the world the one that's under the most attack by the mafia done. That's the world we're living in. You don't talk about it. Well, Noam Chomsky, it was a pleasure to have you on News Click and especially to end our time with you, um, with you speaking so passionately about Cuba. Thanks a lot. Good to talk to you. Thanks. <laughs> on to the next. <laughs>